Welcome to State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well, broadcasting on KSQD Santa Cruz on 90.7 FM and live streaming over the web at ksqd.org. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, licensed marriage and family therapist. Today, we're going to be hearing about a recovery journey from one of the more dangerous eating disorders called anorexia nervosa. Eating disorders are serious, potentially life-threatening conditions that affect a person's emotional and physical health and have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. Specifically, anorexia nervosa, which is often just referred to as anorexia, is a type of eating disorder that's characterized by an obsessive desire to lose weight by refusing to eat. People with anorexia eat so little that they have unhealthy weight loss and become dangerously thin. They may think they're overweight or fat when they are underweight or thin. It's a serious health problem that can increase the risk of early death. Anorexia generally affects girls and women three times more often than boys and men. With me today to talk about recovery from eating disorders and specifically from anorexia are Evelyn Strauss and psychotherapist Jean Willis. At age 15, Evelyn Strauss wanted to shed a little weight. Six months later, she had lost 50 pounds and her diet had consumed her mind as well as her body. Obsessed with ever-decreasing numbers on the scale and seeing non-existent fat on her skeletal body, she had fallen into a psychological pit. She was no longer directing her diet. It was directing her. She realized she was in over her head and sought help. After entering one of the country's prominent inpatient behavioral modification units for treating the eating disorder, she gained weight, but the program failed to focus on her troubled state of mind. Over the next several years, Evelyn worked her way out of the physical and psychological manifestations of anorexia through a self-created and unconventional path, which we'll learn more about later in this program. As Evelyn cultivated an understanding and compassion for herself, she made lasting peace with food and with her body. Evelyn's a PhD biologist turned writer who lives in Santa Cruz with her partner of 28 years and a teenage son. She believes everyone has a powerful capacity to heal and natural insight into how best to do that. Jean Willis is a licensed marriage and family therapist with five years of experience working in eating disorder treatment at both residential and the day treatment levels. She's the Assistant Clinical Director of the Lotus Collaborative Eating Disorder Treatment Center in Santa Cruz, where she provides individual and group therapy, as well as supervision of associate therapists and recovery counselors. Jean also maintains a private practice focused on trauma resolution. She utilizes multiple therapeutic modalities, including EMDR, internal family systems, and hypnotherapy, while also weaving in somatic work schema therapy, CBT, spiritual resourcing, and mindfulness practices, according to the needs of the individuals and groups with whom she works. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So glad you're here with me today. So uh, Jean is here with us to help us learn about anorexia and eating disorders and give us more information about local resources and support options. So Jean, could you describe what eating disorders are and how anorexia is one specific form of eating disorders and, and who is generally affected by them? A lot of information there. You want me um, to break that up? That's okay. So for um, the American Psychological Association definition of an eating disorder is that eating disorders are illnesses in which people experience severe disturbances in their eating behaviors and related thoughts and emotions. People with eating disorders typically become preoccupied, preoccupied with food and their body weight, which is also true. And there are a wide array of eating disorders. I know today we're going to focus on anorexia nervosa, um, and there are two types of anorexia nervosa even. One is restricting type, and the other is a binge purging type. Um, and, but to have that diagnosis, it, it is the low body weight that puts them into that category. Um, yeah, so in terms of... Who's generally affected by yeah. these? So it is a misconception that only, um, you know, Caucasian, um, middle to upper class adolescent girls are affected. That's an old uh, understanding from many years back. Actually, about 25% um, of folks struggling with eating disorders, as far as we know, are also male. 
um, populations that I have worked with people of all ages, including up to people in their 60s. Um, the, there are specific at-risk populations um, in the LGBTQ community. Uh, there's a higher prevalence than in the heterosexual identified community, particularly growing population is transgender or folks who identify as non-binary. And it's, you know, statistics are sort of impossible to know how accurate they are because of underrepresentation. So just as an example, folks, um, transgender and non-binary folks have not sought treatment for oh, quite some time because of their identi gender identity and how that is, you know, handled in programs and so forth. Also, older folks think, oh, it's just a young person's disease and so, or disorder, and, and so they are less likely to seek treatment. Um, folks of African American descent are 50% more likely to develop bulimia, for example, and um, according to the statistics, and Hispanics are more likely to um, end up with bulimia or binge eating disorder. So there's, you know, there's a lot of variation. Um, older adults, now hospitalizations, um, you know, 25% of them are over 40, over age 45 who end up in the hospital from the eating disorder. Oh, and wow. So you're saying there's a, there's, is that been a changing trend? That I think it's a changing trend that they're seeking treatment. I don't know if it's a change, I don't know if it's yeah. a changing trend in um, actually, uh, you know, increased in the eating disorder, um, but for the, from uh, 1999 to 2009, there's been an 88 percent increase of older adults ending up in the and hospital. And who does that refer to, older adults? Do you know what population that is? Um, well, in one study, it was over age 45 that they were talking oh, okay. about. But, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do people recover from anorexia and other eating disorders? Absolutely. People do recover. It's a very challenging um, disorder to treat and to recover from, so I won't sugarcoat it. Sometimes folks recognize it early enough and it has a lower complexity level of what drives the eating disorder in the first place and can recover with outpatient therapy only. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes um, folks are in treatment multiple times, you know, they'll gain some traction, they'll go out and live their lives, they'll do okay for a little while and maybe a triggering event, you know, sends them back down that path again. So it's not unusual for folks to be in treatment multiple times and, um, you know, it's, I don't see that as going back to square one. I see that as having healed from an aspect of it enough to function for a while and then to have to come back and do some deeper work. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you sharing that because I think that's true of a lot of recovery paths that it's not like, oh, let's get this taken care of and then I can get on with my life mm -hmm. frequently. Mm -hmm. You know, people will recover enough, live for a while and there's some kind of setback or, but it doesn't mean they're back to square one. They're starting in a new place with that and moving forward from there. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate you highlighted that point. I, that's what I see myself as well. Mm -hmm. um, so also with us today is Evelyn Strauss, and she's been generous about coming to share her very personal story about experiencing anorexia nervosa and finding her um, very unique recovery path. Um, so Evelyn, could you share with us about how you came to develop anorexia nervosa and what did it look like for you? Sure. So I was 15 and a half years old, and actually it was April 1st, and I went on a diet and kind of joked to myself, like, ha-ha, this will be just like any other diet, and it's especially appropriate because it's April Fool's Day, and I'll stay on it for a few weeks, and, you know, then I'll be eating bowls of cho chocolate or coffee ice cream again. Um, but this diet was different, and um, I, it, so in less than six months, as you said, um, I lost 50 pounds, mostly through food restriction, also by exercising quite a bit. Um, I became more and more obsessed with what I was going to eat, what I wasn't going to eat. I saw food words in words that had no, like that they weren't about food. Like I just was really becoming obsessed. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't concentrate. Um, the diet was taking over my mind. And I knew that. And I, it was very, it was a very uncomfortable experience, but I also, two other things were going on. One was that um, I felt good about my success. I mean, I was really, really good at losing weight. 
Um, and I like being a thinner. Um, and I, I also knew that I, I was a, probably unusually self-aware about what I was doing and why I was doing it. And I knew that I knew that I was sort of trying to erase myself, that I felt like I was invisible anyway, and so I was trying to make my outsides match my insides. I knew that I felt like I didn't deserve to be here. I didn't, you know, eventually that translated into I didn't deserve to eat. Um, I felt unlovable, unworthy, and it was sort of almost an offer to fully erase myself to my parents. Um, and I also desperately wanted help, and I wanted to try to sort out my misery. I knew I had been depressed for a very long time, um, and it was that was invisible too. You know, I was basically high functioning. You know, I did well in school. I didn't have social problems. I, I looked like a perfectly happy fifteen-year-old with lots of friends, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there was sort of no outward evidence that anything was wrong. Um, so, yeah. So eventually what happened was that um, I, my, my mother was getting increasingly upset and sort of, you know, accusing me of wanting to lose more weight. And it was an accusation. It wasn't a, why are you doing this, honey? You know, I want to help you. And so she was angry. I think she was probably terrified and maybe didn't realize that. Um, and at some point when I got, when it was clear that I was way too thin, my father did things like say, you know, if you had strep throat, you wouldn't think about it, you would just take antibiotics. And your, for your illness, your food, uh, sorry, your medicine is food. So you just have to eat in this, and in the same way that you don't think about taking antibiotics, you just do it. So that was kind of helpful, but it was sort of too late. And mm -hmm. um, at some point, I just, there was this moment where I was sitting on the couch and my father came in and said, time for dinner. And I just kind of went limp inside and said, I need help. Um, so I, so the first thing, they took me to a psychiatrist who my father had known from a long time earlier. And he prescribed, he, he told me to eat three bowls of soup a day. And he also prescribed Thorazine and Stelazine. This was pre-internet. I had no idea what Thorazine or Stelazine were, but I did know that he was telling me that I should take them to relax. And I said to him, I'm not tense, I'm anorexic. And he said, if you're not eating and you know it's gonna kill you and you still can't eat, you're stressed. And so I thought, okay, he has a point, but like the last thing I wanna do is fall asleep. Like the dentist wouldn't even give me nitrous because I was so small and I thought, if I take these drugs, I'm just going to fall asleep, and I'm not going to be able to do anything I need to do to get better if I'm asleep. I don't think this is a good idea. So I refused to take the drugs, mm -hmm. which didn't go over very well with my mom, mm -hmm. as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, but I said, what about a hospital? So I ended, I ended up, I landed in, a, um, in an wait, inpatient. Wait, wait, wait. I want to back you up. Yeah. You said, what about a hospital? Yeah, I did. So you were the first one that asked for that kind of level of care? Yes. What made you, do you have any idea how you had that idea in your mind that that was an option for you? Yeah, so um, somebody I knew at school had been hospitalized for anorexia. So I knew that there were inpatient units for anorexia. Um, and I knew that this stelazine, thorazine, three bowls of soup, I, I mean, I would have lost weight on three bowls of soup. I just thought, does this guy know anything about calories? It just, mm -hmm. it was so completely off base. Mm -hmm. um, it just didn't seem like, it wasn't, I knew it wasn't mm -hmm. going to help me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's how I knew, though, because another friend of mine had, had been hospitalized. I always marvel at that sort of survival instinct in us that can find those little possibilities when, like that at 15, you, you knew to ask that. that. That's remarkable to me. Yeah, it is remarkable. Mm -hmm. You're tuned to listener-supported 90.7 FM KSQD Santa Cruz, k Squid. Many voices, one station, and this is State of Mind, being human and living well. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with guest Evelyn Strauss 
and psychotherapist Jean Willis about Evelyn's recovery from the eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, and Jean is helping us learn more about eating disorder conditions. Eating disorders can affect people of any age, race, gender, or sexual orientation. They are often diagnosed in teenagers and young adults, but many people are first diagnosed with an eating disorder in later adulthood. In the U.S., 20 million women and 10 million men will struggle with an eating disorder at some point in their lives. And now a word from our underwriter. KSQD thanks Family Service Agency of the Central Coast for supporting this program. Family Service Agency provides counseling and support for people of all ages facing life crises and challenges. You can reach them at 423-9444 to see if they can help you. Thank you, Family Service Agency of the Central Coast, for supporting KSQD 90.7 FM. Back to our interview. So, um, Evelyn, you were talking about your experience in the hospital and um, how you realized that you weren't going to be helped there. So, um, what did help you? I mean, from there, you know, where did you move on to that you actually started a path of recovery? So, I got out of the hospital. I knew the hospital wasn't going to help, so I could check that one off my list. Um, things with my parents really weren't better. Um, and I was profoundly isolated because I knew that if I talked about my disordered thinking um, and my desire to keep losing weight, I was just going to basically get in trouble, mm. right? But I also knew that I, I, I didn't want to keep, I mean, I mean, a part of me wanted to keep losing weight and a part of me wanted to get better. I knew that this was a, sort of a blind alley, that it wasn't going to help me. It wasn't the path to healing, actually. Um, and I wanted release from this obsession. I mean, the obsession itself was incredibly painful. Um, so, I mean, basically, I kept my, you know, I, as I said, you can't gain that much weight. But, you know, I kept on enough weight so that when they weighed me every week or every other week after I had drunk a ton of water, you know, I would meet my 100-pound goal, right? And I knew that my brother, with whom I have a wonderful relationship, um, was coming home at, over the winter break. And so basically looking forward to my brother coming home kind of allowed me to at least get the, keep the weight stuff solid enough that I didn't have, to, that I didn't wind up back in the hospital. Then my brother came home and kind of treated me like a normal person, which was such a relief. Like he would just say things like, oh, do you want to go out for pizza? And I mean, nobody had asked me that for a long time, right? Everybody was walking on eggshells. I probably wouldn't have said yes to many other people, but I did, and he just, he just spent the entire break hanging out with me. So I got this big, you know, bolus of love and affection and attention. And the other thing he did, which I don't think he really did this intentionally to help me get, get over my eating disorder. I don't think he knew enough about eating disorders, but he convinced me to audition for the school musical. So then I was in Little Mary Sunshine, and there were two really good things about that. One was that I didn't want to end up back in the hospital because I would miss rehearsals. So that kept me focused on like eating enough. And the other thing, it just was a distraction. I mean, a positive distraction. I like singing, I like performing, and we were working on this musical. And so I got a break from thinking about anorexia. Yeah. So that was the first thing. Yeah. And then basically, I mean, I just I gained some weight and lost some weight again. And by the time I left for college, I was once again underweight. but. I just by that time knew that I wasn't, I, 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 I had to lie about my weight in order to leave because there was no way I was going to get better there. And I didn't know how I was going to get better, but I knew that it wasn't going to happen in the place where I grew up. Yeah. So let's, I, I just want to turn to Jean for a moment because, well, actually, I want to back up a little bit. You were talking about your experience in the hospital and the way that um, they approached your treatment at that time. And I'm just wondering if you could contextualize it. Like, what time period are we talking about? What? Late 70s. Late 70s. So 1977. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. And I'm just curious, Jean, when you were listening, I was sort of seeing you squirm in your seat a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> so what was going on for you as you listened to um, Evelyn's story of entering the hospital and how she experienced that? Yeah, that's really painful to hear. And I'm so sorry that's the way you were treated. Um, you know, treatment even now, and that's that's quite a long time ago in the late 70s. I don't know how much they knew um, at that point. I wasn't in eating disorder treatment at that, uh, you know, recovery work that at that time. The stories that I hear from clients who have been at other programs, who have been hospitals, not hospitalized, not everybody starts in the hospital. They may start at lower levels of care, but the experience is very variable. Um, like anything, you know, there are better and less great um, treatment centers and hospital situations. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't met too many clients who enjoyed their stay in the hospital. Um, hospitalization is the highest level of care, and that's typically for medical stabilization. They want to get the weight back on you. I was horrified to hear that they were expecting you to gain a half a pound a day, because what we know now is there's something called refe refeeding syndrome that can be very dangerous um, to try to put the weight back on too quickly and um, really uncomfortable putting it mildly painful um, to do that kind of work. And, you know, for true recovery from an eating disorder, yes, the behavioral piece is needed. You know, you need to help people restore weight or and or, even if they don't need to restore weight, establish healthy eating patterns. But you have to get to the deeper work. You have to get to what formed the eating disorder in the for first place, what maintains it, um, you know, and Every, all, I can't remember a single client that I've worked with in the last five years that didn't have a co-occurring mental health disorder that can intertwined. You, can you describe what that is? What's a co-occurring mental health disorder? Yeah, so at the same time they have another mental health disorder. Um, according to the stats, it's 97% of folks with eating disorders have something else. Um, depression is the most prominent, 94% depression. 56% anxiety disorders, I would challenge that and say it's probably more. Um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, you talked about obsessions and compulsion, compulsions and you know again with these diagnoses it's also like with statistics you know you can have obsessive and compulsive behaviors and tendencies without meeting quite criteria for the disorder um, diagnosis. Post-traumatic stress disorder, the stats say 22 to 25 percent, but you have to remember that meeting criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder um, is very specific. And difficult to meet, actually. And difficult, yeah. right, which but includes all kinds of flashbacks and nightmares and right. hypervigilance, and there's lots of things involved in that, but I would say far more um, of the clients that I've worked with have been traumatized and maybe not meet criteria for that specific diagnosis, so that's misleading to say mm -hmm. it's only 22 to 25 percent. But many have a history of trauma. Have a history yeah. of trauma, neglect, as you started to allude to, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what we call attachment injury. Um, according to the stats, 22 percent had an alcohol or substance use disorder as well. And what we often see when that's the case is, you know, you they'll go into treatment maybe for the substance abuse and get that down and the eating disorder gets worse. I'm gesturing as though you could see me. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes we'll call it whack-a-mole, uh -huh. you know, like we get the eating disorder little under control and then their urges to engage in the substance abuse go up and so forth. The self-harm, there's all kinds of behaviors that are in that mix for a lot of folks struggling with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you don't work with what's really the deeper work and what's underlying, um, the, it's going to be temporary, for sure, the Would recovery. You, and, you know, it seemed to me what Evelyn was um, pointing out was what was so important to her at that time was the idea of forming a relationship with a therapist who was going to help her. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. to what extent is the emphasis now on building that relationship with the patient or client? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, the highest level of care, as I said, was uh, hospitalization. The next level of care down is residential, which is 24-7. You actually live in, at the facility, and they do, um, you know, this more comprehensive treatment. But still, at the residential level, folks are so ill that stabilization is really the goal at first. And then there's a step down to what's called PHP very odd name. PHP stands for Partial Hospitalization Program, but it has nothing to do with the hospital. Uh, it's a, usually a six and a half hour day program, sometimes longer. 
day program at that level and then you can start to not only continue the behavioral work and the meal support and all of that but also you know really work on the depression the anxiety and all the other co-occurring things that are going on the trauma so um, in some ways it's not that uncommon that the deeper sort of relational work is not going to happen until right. after the physical aspect is attended to at least out of the danger zone yes mm -hmm. um yeah and then you know ultimately you get to work integration, work integrating all that you've learned. And the next step down from PHP is IOP, which stands for intensive outpatient, and that's usually about a three and a half hour day treatment. So it, all of those include meal support just at reduced amounts. Mm -hmm. PHP, there's two meals and a snack. IOP, there's one meal and a snack, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last level would be at outpatient. And a lot of folks do start at outpatient. They thought, I'll find me myself a therapist. So um, yes, eating disorder treatment is an advanced specialty. So most folks start with their therapist. Maybe they have a great relationship with the therapist and they are working on some things, but they haven't been highly trained in how to treat eating disorders. Uh, I remember graduate school, they basically gave us you know, a definition of various eating disorders and didn't even cover all of them, um, of which there are many. And, uh, and uh, all of which are very dangerous. And um, so, you know, finding the right therapist is challenging to find someone not only who you have that rapport with and feel good about and can have the relationship, but who can work on the eating disorder itself as well as all the co-occurring mm -hmm. disorders. Um, so yeah, it's challenging. And at the IOP level, folks are more working toward, they are working on some of those integrations as well and working towards developing a relapse prevention plan and how to go back into their lives and maintain. And for our listeners, I'll just repeat, IOP is for called uh, referring to intensive outpatient treatment, meaning that people come for several hours a day. Yeah, about three and a half. Mm -hmm. Three and a half hours a day, with what frequency? And um, That varies, you know, usually at residential it's seven days a week. At uh, PHP, typically we'll start people at seven days, then go to six, then go to five, and like really work with them around how to manage their day off and gradually build that resilience and then IOP can be uh, anywhere from seven to three days a week and at, at the program where I work the three days a week is like the last few weeks to help bridge integrating back into life more um, more actively and have the program to come back to to okay. reground and reconnect. Okay well it's good to fill in that there's a lot of options between once a week outpatient you know going to your local therapist and being hospitalized that there's a lot of Mm -hmm. up levels depending on what the need is at mm -hmm. that point. Absolutely, and when clients go to outpatient, we strongly recommend they not only see a therapist, but see a dietitian, a psychiatrist, and find some kind of group, support group pro uh, program in their area. You're tuned to Listener Supported 90.7 FM KSQD, K-Squid, and this is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. We're also live streaming over the web at ksqd.org. Now you can tune in to KSQD anytime through your home smart speaker just by saying play KSQD on TuneIn. You can also now listen, download, or subscribe to State of Mind shows on Apple Podcasts and Google Play Music. In case you're just joining us, I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with two guests, Evelyn Strauss and psychotherapist Jean Willis, about how Evelyn forged a recovery path from the eating disorder anorexia nervosa. And Jean is helping us learn more about eating disorders and where and how to get help. Back to our interview. So you were saying earlier that you were making your way to, um, that you asked to go to the hospital and your parents, how did they respond to that request? Oh, they liked that idea. They, I mean, they wanted to go to a hospital. There was one program, I remember, in New York where you were completely cut off from your family and they did not like that. So they liked this program, uh, actually at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, where um, there was a lot of contact, where the idea was a short hospital stay. It was a behavior modification program. Do you want to describe for our listeners what that means, mm -hmm. behavior modification? So I had to gain half a pound a day, or I would lose, um, or I would lose uh, privileges, like be on bed rest, not allowed, be allowed to have visitors, and. I mean, I, was, I would agree to anything at that point, really. My goal was, I, I was, once we decided I was going to go to the hospital, oh, and there was a family therapy component, too. And this was a very prominent family therapy operation at that time. Um, 
I mean, it may still be for all I know, but it, it certainly was at that time. Um, and so I was looking forward to it because I thought finally someone will help me. Finally, somebody will ask me, why are you doing this? Like, how can I help you? Maybe they would say, look, you just need to eat and you need to keep your body afloat while we help you sort out these. Like, I kind of knew what to say to myself, but I didn't have, I wasn't empowered to believe myself. I wasn't allowed to take care of myself because of my history and pathology. Um, so, yeah, so I went to the hospital and I, um, and nobody came. So I went and I hung around my room and I thought, okay, somebody will come and talk to me and I'll start, you know, getting sort of at least a, sort of connected to somebody and, and feel some kind of flicker of hope and um, some sense that I'll be supported. And instead, what happened was nobody came and instead this giant plate of spaghetti showed up. And I mean, I hadn't eaten anything for the previous, literally almost nothing, like maybe an English muffin every day. I mean, under 500 calories a day from when I knew I was going to be admitted to that hospital to when I was admitted to the hospital. Um, because I knew, like, it was too hard to eat. I felt too guilty when I ate. And so, it was, and I knew that in two weeks I wasn't going to drop dead, especially if I kept drinking, which I always did. This was another way that I actually safeguarded my health. I knew that I had to drink so that my electrolytes wouldn't go out of whack so I wouldn't have a heart attack. And I absolutely was very careful about that. But, I mean, I went from really being unable to eat to being faced with this giant plate of spaghetti. And nobody had shown up. And I knew that I had to gain that half pound. I knew I had to eat everything on that tray or I, it would be an act of bad faith for one thing. And um, I would lose my privileges the next day. And um, it was the most awful, one of the most awful moments of my life, actually. Mm -hmm. Certainly up to that point, it was one of the most awful moments of my life because suddenly I had to transform myself into someone who deserved to eat that plate of spaghetti or at least could put aside these screaming voices that were telling me not to eat it. So I did, um, and I realized that I was on my own. And that was really chilling. Um, you know, eventually the therapist did show up, um, and we did start to meet with them, but no, and, and so I was hopeful again, and I, this is so hard for people to believe, but it's really true. Nobody ever asked me, how do you feel? Nobody ever asked me, what do you think is going on? Um, I had a huge amount of insight, actually, mm -hmm. um, into mm -hmm. why I was anorexic, and um, they were so focused on the family rather than the identified patient that they really overshot and they just, they ignored me. And um, I gained weight really fast. You actually can't sustainably gain half a pound a day. Um, so, but I, once I knew I was on my own, I, I mean, then I was trapped, right? Then I'm in this hospital and nobody's there to help me and my only friend is Josie in the next bed, who is also an anorexic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just thought, I have to get out of here. This solution, I thought this was going to be a good solution, but it's a crappy solution. I'm not going to be helped here. Yeah. The therapist did help my parents quite a bit. And that, I'm sure, did secondhand help me, but really not very much with my mm. eating disorder and my feelings of unworthiness yeah. and unlovability. So, um, what, what, and actually, can I back up a yeah. little bit? Because because um, Jean, as Jean was talking, I was realizing I don't know if I stressed enough one thing that I think is really important. Um, everybody was really focused on the physical. So like on one hand, of course, you have to do the, stable, the medical stabilization. On the other hand, even after I left the hospital and even after I was convincing people, and I was, I mean, I had, I had sort of stably gained 10 pounds and I was 95 pounds rather than 85 pounds, which is a big difference and puts me sort of, you know, whatever. I wasn't in danger of, I wasn't in medical danger. I was very, very thin, but I wasn't in medical danger. Um, and this whole focus, but the focus on the physical manifestations of anorexia persisted. And that made me feel really desperate <laughs> and not understood. Because 
I thought, you know, I know how to control my weight. I could gain weight. I could weigh any number that you told me to weigh. I could weigh 120 pounds for the rest of my life, and I would still be miserable. I would not have solved anything. Um, so I was really worried about that. Um, and it made me feel, as I said, really isolated. And even after I was left the hospital, um, it, it, it wasn't just a question of focusing on the physical aspects until I left the hospital and then actually getting around to doing therapy. We were doing family therapy and nobody ever asked me what was going on or how I felt. Um, and they just saw, I mean, I read my psych records eventually, and, you know, they just saw an, you know, attractive, intelligent, high-functioning 16-year-old who happened to be starving herself, and they work with my parents. Um, so that, yeah, so I completely, I mean, obviously you have to get the medical stuff stabilized, but I think there still now a lot of parents especially, at least I don't have a large sample size, but the few parents I know um, are understandably really focused on their kids, how they look and how thin they are and what they're eating and how bizarre they're being about food. And I think that is such a red herring. Yeah, you have to get somebody medically stabilized, but um, it's just, that is a symptom. It's just a symptom. And as Jean was saying, you know, at least for me, there is profound underlying depression. Um, you know, and then layer on top of it all this bizarre stuff about eating and weight. So, yes, so by the time I left for college, um, I was not losing weight. I knew I didn't want to lose weight. I knew I had to get out of there and move on. At college, things did start to turn around. First of all, I met somebody, a friend, um, who I didn't, I didn't know when I met her. I just connected with her, and I just really liked her. Um, and it turned out that she had had anorexia, and she was actually bulimic at that time. So now I had a friend who I could talk to and who I could be honest with about what was going on. This was the very first time that I could reveal without getting in trouble um, what, was going, you know, what was happening. She was, so that was a huge relief, just having company, right? And mm -hmm. just having somebody who understood. Um, and also we joked, you know, we were gonna write a book called A Thousand Ways to Eat a Lettuce Leaf. And, you know, there were gonna be chapters on, you know, well, depending on how many, you know, however many letters are in your mailbox today, that's how many apples we get to eat. So it was sort of sick, dark humor, but it was really nice to have somebody to share that with. So just Tracy's company was huge for me. It was just huge. It was such a relief. Um, and then I had this epiphany, and I don't know what triggered it, but I do know I was in my dorm room, and I just, I just, suddenly realize you are, talking to myself, you are irrationally afraid of getting fat. Like, I don't know what you're scared of, but it is crazy. Like, I don't know, what, it's not clear why, but it's clear that that is a huge block to you ever getting better. And again, I knew I could control my weight and I knew that I could weigh any amount. But what I really didn't want to do was look normal and not have actually healed. Within a few seconds, I realized that since I was irrationally afraid of getting fat, the only way that I was ever going to overcome that was to get fat and just to face it. And I didn't, because I, I knew it was crazy. I knew that, like, yeah, maybe it'd be unpleasant in certain ways, but the degree to which I was scared had no basis in reality. I didn't even know what it was about. And so that's what I did. So within a year, I went from 95 pounds to about 225 pounds um, and you know obviously ended up I mean that's difficult to do <laughs> unless you have a you know some metabolic problems which I didn't um, and so you know I was compulsively eating and um, and gaining a lot of weight um, and feeling a lot of mixed up things right I was ashamed because I was ashamed of being fat you know I'm sure that was one of the things that I had been afraid of um, I was confused I still didn't really, I mean, I knew a lot of things that was, were going on, but I still didn't really have any kind of um, deep level support for untangling why I was doing what I was doing. But I also started reading a lot, um, things like everything from like fat is a feminist issue, um, at some point around there, Kim Chernin's The Obsession, 
um, came out and sort of light Buddhist stuff on self-compassion and kindness and um, that kind of thing. And um, gradually, I started relaxing about food and eating. And so now, instead of trying to relax while I'm gradually moving up the scale, which is something that inherently terrifies me, I'm in a very high weight. And so if I start to relax and eat it when I'm hungry, I'm losing weight now, right, in a healthy way. I'm gradually learning how to eat when I'm hungry. I gradually realize, like, oh, you know, if you binge, you don't have to keep binging. <laughs> like, you can stop. It's not going to make you feel any better to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, I gradually started realizing that there was a space, that I could build in a space between the desire to eat that piece of cake that I didn't really need um, and actually doing it. And in that space, I had the opportunity to ask myself things like, what do you really need? Like, what are you, and what, what is, what, do, what does some part of you feel like this food is going to serve? You know, mm -hmm. what it's going to do for you? And, I mean, nobody told me to do that, but I just kind of made up all of that. And it's so interesting. It's like you learned how to show up for yourself. Like you were waiting for someone to show up, someone to show up. And then you learned how to show up for yourself and ask yourself, what, what do I need, you know, and what am I feeling? <laughs> What's the urge about? Yeah. Yeah. So I gradually basically relaxed into good eating habits. And so I had a long and slow weight loss. And then, you know, you know, eventually ended up back in sort of a normal weight range. The other important thing that happened during this time that I think really was important for my healing was that I'd taken a year off of college between my, after my freshman year, um, to work and just, I was newly politicized and I was doing community work and, you know, I was a young idealist and, um, and also dealing with, you know, weighing 225 pounds and trying to make peace with myself and my body and, um, and, by the time I went back to school, my brain was like a dried sponge. I mean, I was desperate to learn. And so, you know, I went from being a person who just thought, oh, of course I'll go to college, everybody goes to college, you know, this is sort of my social and educational class, to feeling like I am so lucky I get to go to college, I am so lucky I get to go and study organic chemistry. And so I threw myself into my studies, I loved it. Um, you know, so I was, I didn't have a lot of friends at the time, but I felt, you know, I did extremely well in school, almost inadvertently. I mean, just because I was studying, because I loved it so much. I wasn't trying to do, I wasn't trying to get good grades. I was just trying to, it was soak just it fun. Up. Soak it up. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I had, again, just like the musical, there was this, you know, there was this, uh, these activities. Positive namely, things happening in your life. Yeah. Uh -huh. That, uh, that distracted my brain and that were really engaging for my brain and gave me an option to thinking about food. Um, yeah. So So it sounds yeah. like, yeah, it sounds like in some ways um, I just heard this sort of maturation process happening where you became more resourceful, you know, internally um, and for yourself. I'm just thinking of the many patients you've worked with and what of Evelyn's story um, stands out to you as either something you often see or really unusual? So many things stand out to uh -huh. me. Um, I think everyone's um, development of their eating disorder, experience with their eating disorder, and recovery from their eating disorder is different. Um, there are lots of similarities. I loved that you talked about how it felt to meet someone you could be honest with about your eating disorder. And that's one of the things that's um, very key, I find, in the treatment at the levels of care that I work. Uh, you know, at PHP and IOP, not only are, do they see a therapist and a dietitian and the psychiatrist at the PHP level and have the meal support and the group therapy and the individual therapy, but the milieu interaction between the clients is extremely important. Folks begin to feel like they're not so alone and I'm not the only person who hates myself or who has these feelings or these behaviors. Um, so that was lovely to hear you, you know, illuminate that. It is a big part of um, the treatment process. That's why support groups are so, you know, so useful. Um, a few things that I, I just want to make sure I say. <laughs> That's the importance of group. 
Um, I also want to say that you cannot tell by looking at someone if they have an eating disorder or not. Um, and of course, we are talking specifically about anorexia today, which the diagnosis for that does is qualified by being underweight. Uh, however, folks are very good at hiding it, um, wear bulky clothes and so forth, and uh, you know, very honest people end up lying and sneaking and engaging in all kinds of behaviors to hide their eating disorder. So um, when Evelyn was describing that she was just hanging at this weight, like that was just mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. you still felt like that would be a just, she still had an eating disorder oh, absolutely. at that time. Yeah. Absolutely, because mm -hmm. all, the, all the underlying things were still there. And it is not unusual for pe people to flip you know, you described being in that, qualifying for anorexia and that diagnosis, and then eating compulsively for a period of time and gaining a bunch of weight, and that's not unusual either. Rarely, I find, is, is there a pure restricting type anorexia nervosa. And you said you were proud of, you know, there, I'm not sure if you use the word proud, proud, but I hear that a lot, that folks are proud that, of their ability to restrict gives them a sense of control and a sense of strength and, you know, I can do this which other people can't seem to do. Um, and then the flip side, you know, is that they're ashamed when they do engage in binging or compulsive eating. Also the purging comes in, but there's, they're much less likely to talk about it. So you can get the impression that the anorexia is pure um, and only, I put air quotes around the pure, um, only, you know, restriction. But it's much more common to see people say, I'll restrict all day and binge at night, or, and I may compensate with exercise as you um, had described as well. So it is quite complex. Um, the other things, there were so many things that came up when you were speaking. Um, it, you know, the vast majority of folks that I've worked with who suffer from a variety of eating disorders are very intelligent and precocious even, and that people who don't understand eating disorders say, well, it's not logical, just eat. You know, why can't you just eat? And it's not a logical process, it's an emotional process. Um, you even knew that you had an eating disorder. Lots of folks come into treatment and say, I'm not so sure I have an eating disorder, and, and that doesn't, you know, that's not me. Um, and so there is a, this disconnect between what you know intellectually and what you feel and experience emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of folks, it, there's a sense of they're being emotionally full, which they translate into I'm, I'm physically full, so I can't eat anymore. Um, those kinds of things. And what we know about trauma um, is also plays, comes into play, because uh, as I said, lots of folks um, feel flooded as part of feeling trauma, right? Exactly. Yeah, emotionally feel, flooded. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And, you know, when you're in that space, then your body physiologically is sending all your energy to your extremities to flee or fight, um, or in some cases freeze, um, in many cases freeze but also shuts down digestion. So there is a physiological experience of it's uncomfortable to eat. Um, and so folks will avoid eating for that reason mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fabulous that you, Evelyn, on your own pretty much with limited support were able to get to that place where you could um, have true hunger and fullness cues and, and arrive at a healthy weight for yourself in that manner. In my experience with folks with um, eating disorders, that's the last thing to heal. So hunger and fullness cues aren't exactly reliable uh, until you've gotten some recovery under your belt for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not hungry, so I'm, I'm not going to eat. It just doesn't work mm -hmm. when your you know, brain has been deprived or your body has also been um, confused and gone in and out of starvation mode so many times that your body actually gets confused. Yeah. You're tuned to listener-supported 90.7 FM, KSQD, K-Squid, Community Radio for the Monterey Bay. And this is State of Mind, being human and living well. We're also live streaming over the web at ksqd.org. Now you can catch any of your favorite programs on K-Squid through your home smart speaker just by saying, play KSQD on TuneIn. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I'm here talking with guests Evelyn Strauss and psychotherapist Jean Willis about Evelyn's recovery from the eating disorder anorexia nervosa, and Jean is to helping dispel common myths about anorexia and helping us understand what is involved in recovery and what to expect in seeking treatment. And now a word from our underwriter. 
KSQD thanks the Body Positive Institute for supporting State of Mind. The Body Positive Institute teaches individuals, educators, and treatment providers research-based principles for positive body image through online and customized in-person trainings at thebodypositive.org. Thank you, Body Positive Institute, for supporting Community Radio, K-Squid, 90.7 FM. Back to our interview. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time here, so I just wanted to ask, you know, there were a couple of resources that each of you had mentioned. I wonder if there are maybe specific resources um, that would be good for our listeners to know about that you haven't yet mentioned. The ones that you've already talked about, I want to remind people they will be posted on the website with the shows and links and um, access to them can be found there. So, um, Jean, are there specific um, resources that you might want to share with folks? Well, there's lots, but uh, you asked before, so Nita, I have mentioned the uh, nationaleatingdisorders.org. You could just Google N-E-D-A and it'll come up. The Lotus Collaborative is the Eating Disorder Treatment Center in Santa Cruz. Um, we also have a center in San Francisco, and um, there are programs over the hill and programs uh, you know, in Monterey and, and Pacific Grove as well, but this is the only one in Santa Cruz. And uh, the website is the thelotuscollaborative.com. The phone number is 855-852-4968. Um, a couple of other resources that my colleagues suggested. Um, there's a website called The Body Is Not An Apology to really address and look at re one's relationship with, you know, the body image and the dynamics from the media and all those influences in one's life. And then I wanted to put in, because Lotus is very um, committed to serving the LGBT community um, and transgender folks who have a higher risk factor for eating disorders, there's a website called transfolksfightingeds.org, and folks is spelled F-O-L-X, so T-R-A-N-S-F-O-L-X, fightingeds.org would be another website to look at. Great. And Evelyn, are there specific resources besides those that you've mentioned that you'd want to share with our listeners that have helped you on your recovery path? I mentioned The Obsession, which I thought was a really good book, and I mentioned terabrach.org. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, the other thing that helped me not with, I was long past my eating disorder by the, by the time I found it. I don't think it was even developed until after I was better. but. Um, is in terms of therapy is internal family systems, which um, is, was developed by Richard Schwartz. And um, anyway, the, I would just start by reading the introduction to the internal family systems model. And it's important to read that one and not this thicker book it, because this one really is an introduction. There's another one that is more of a handbook for practice, and it's good, but you kind of have to know something for mm -hmm. Okay. It's the most humane form, I think, of psycho or modality of psychotherapy that I've ever encountered because it assumes that, er, that you're doing things for a reason, that even misguided, um, self-destructive behavior is coming from a desire to heal. And so there's no reason for shame. There's a lot of reason to try to understand and get to, get, uh, to understand what you're doing and why um, and to take care of you know, the parts of you that are driving you to do misguided things. So I just think it's, it's a very, it's a most, if, if done properly, which is really important, um, it's a very powerful healing tool. Okay, great. And uh, we're really close to the end of our time, but I'm wondering, you know, if there are any closing thoughts um, that you wanted to share with our listeners, anything that you might have hoped that you said that you haven't yet shared? Jean? Um, you know, I'm just recognizing that this program has been focused on anorexia and particularly restricting type for the most part, but that there are other equally as, dis, you know, destructive eating disorders out there, bulimia, nervosa, binge eating disorder is actually more common than, um, than anorexia. There are anorexia nervosa 
there's another diagnosis category called atypical. And when I was talking about you can't tell by looking at someone uh, uh, if they have an eating disorder or not, they could have anorexia nervosa in an atypical state so that they do not appear underweight or aren't underweight but are still suffering the same kinds of things. Atypical for bulimia nervosa and, and all that as well. Um, and, you know, multiple more configurations, diabulimia, for example, where someone manipulates their insulin as part of their eating disorder. So just very important to recognize, and please refrain from telling someone, if they tell you they have an eating disorder, please don't say, you don't look like you have an eating disorder. That actually translates to folks that I don't deserve to get treatment, I'm not sick enough. Um, and so it's, it, it's really destructive to, and I understand, we don't have that much information. Um, what would be a more helpful thing to say? Um, it, uh, tell me more. <laughs> tell me more. Yeah, tell me more. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested in hearing what's going on for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And is there a way I can support you? Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Evelyn, any last thoughts or comments? I think I said these things, but I'm going to say them again. One of them is to really remember that the physical manifestations of anorexia are a symptom. And um, when approaching the illness, it's really crucial to treat the underlying invisible emotional slash psychological underpinnings. Um, and that you can look healthy without having recovered. That's, I think it's just really dangerous and terrifying to somebody, at least the people I've known who've had anorexia, that that could happen, certainly for me. Mm -hmm. um, a second thing is that people really do have an inherent drive toward healing. Um, I obviously haven't tested that hypothesis in everybody in the world, but I just, from my experience, it's true. Um, and it's important to trust that phenomenon. And as we discussed with anorexia, it might look nutty and it's important to at least consider the possibility that this person really is on to something. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing is that it is self-destructive. Anorexia and other eating disorders are very self-destructive, but they really are um, an impulse toward healing. I'm your host, Deborah Sloss, and I want to say thank you again to my guests today, Evelyn Strauss and Jean Willis, and thanks to you for joining us here on State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. To hear more conversations about mental health and wellness here on California's Central Coast, join me on the first Sunday of every month from 6 to 7 p.m. right here at K-Squid, 90.7 FM. You can also find the podcast episodes of this show on our KSQD website by typing State of Mind in the search bar. This is Community Radio, and we want to hear our listeners' stories and questions. In our shows, we seek to educate by featuring personal stories of mental health recovery and wellness and the sharing of resources. So please give us a call or email us if you have a topic idea or you have an experience you think would be of interest to our listeners or if you have questions you'd like to ask our guests. You may just become part of one of our future shows. Call us at 831-824-4324. Say your name and leave a one to three minute message or email us at debra.stateofmind at ksqd.org. These are some of the upcoming show topics you might wanna comment on. The mental health effects of Lyme disease, teens in addiction, teens in anxiety, and forgiveness. Special thanks to our audio editor, Jeannie Baltikowski, and to Jennifer Young, who assists with research and outreach. And finally, thanks to acoustic guitarist, Adrian Legg, for composing, performing, and donating the use of our theme music. This is listener-supported community radio, so that means we want and we need to hear from you. Let us know what you think about this or any of the shows you're hearing here on KSQD. Just send us an email at onair, that's O-N-A-I-R, at ksqd.org, or call 831-900-5773. This is KSQD Santa Cruz. Just remember, 90.7 FM, K-Squid, your ink spot on the dial. Stay with us.